let's take a deeper dive into the outlook for crisis management and the resolution framework with our next panel today, which is moderated by Laura Noonan, Financial Regulation Editor of the Financial Times. And Laura will introduce her panel. Over to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Susan. I'm delighted to be the third Irish person that you guys have out of the, the three speakers so far. And I've got a fourth Irish person to my right here, Sean Berrigan, who, as most of you know, um, is... What's your full title? I know it's got a lot of words. Sean, maybe you'd like to share your full title. Director, G Director General for Financial Services, sorry, Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union. Excellent. That's Sean. Fis FISMA will do. Okay. <laughs> well, I did have a ban on all, on all acronyms for this panel. So, uh, Stick with this one. Huh? <laughs> all right. And then next to Sean, we have Elke Koenig, who is, do we call you Director or Chair, chair. of, Chairperson or Chair? Chair of the Singer Resolution. Whatever you want it. <laughs> Whatever we like it. Then we have Peter Simone, and you're currently representing the Association of what's it of bank? I'm, I'm have the managing title. director of the world's oldest global banking network, the World Savings and Retail Banking Institute, 98 years old, and the European arm, the European Savings and Retail Banking Group. Thank you so much. And then next to Peter, we have Irena. Uh, sorry, Irena Tingali, who is chair of the European of the EU's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs um, from the European Parliament. So I'm, I'm very delighted to have all of you guys here. As everyone in the room and in the audience knows, this isn't quite the conference that I think some of you expected to be a week ago when it was meant to be something quite celebratory. And now I guess it's more a point for reflection as to where we are, where we go from here. Um, Sean, I'll start with you. I mean, you've been here from the very, very, very start of this. We're now more than 10 years into the banking union project. Um, we had a very good overview from the commissioner earlier about the things that have been achieved, but did you expect to be further along by now, by 2022? Did you think we, we'd be done? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. I think possibly at the beginning, yes. But as time has gone on, I have become a little bit more, let's say, realistic about the pace of progress. I mean, I think there are two ways you can measure progress in a project like Banking Union, and this sounds a little bit kind of trite, but you can measure progress by how far you've come from the start, or you can measure progress by how long you still have to go to get to the end. Now, I think if we are, you know, if we're fair, we've come a lot longer along the way. So we are more than halfway. I think the very fact we're sitting here in this conference with Andrea and the SSM, having organised Elke here for the SRB, you know, shows that we have made a lot of progress. We have a single rule book, which we continually seek to improve, but it's largely there. And I'll come back to the improvement in a minute. But when I used to, 10 years ago, you know, bore everybody about the benefits of banking union back then, and I can bore you again about them now if you want, we always had these three pillars, you remember? And the three pillars holding up the banking union, and two of them are the SSM and the SRM, and the third pillar was EDIS. So I think the story is that, you know, I don't think, I'm not disappointed that we're not further along. Of course, I would always like to be further along, but I'm realistic. But I do think, unless we get the third pillar in place, the banking union, although it works well, will not work optimally. And, and that's why it's important that, you know, we continue to push to have the third pillar in place. And is there any argument that the third pillar is just no offence, but like never going to happen and we should just make the best of the two pillars we have and make those as optimised as we can get them? Because the third pillar, the, some of the differences are so entrenched that you could just be throwing good money after bad, spending more time on it. I can see Elka shaking your heads over you and next. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, you, you never want something that functions so, so suboptimally. So this is working well, but it could work better. And I don't think it's true, in fact, that we can never get to the point where um, deposit guarantee schemes at European level become sensible and become acceptable. We're not there yet, but I, I, I feel that, you know, if we continue to make the arguments, uh, we, will, we will, will get there. And I think even what we're going to do now in terms of crisis management, I can give you a sneak preview, is going to very quickly reveal how even the improvements we will make in crisis management will not be the full amount because the system could be even more robust yeah. if we had a third pillar. So the arguments for the third pillar aren't going to go away. I mean, there are obstacles that need to be removed and they're difficult to remove, but the arguments why you need a third pillar will remain. I'm going to bring you on this point as well, but first of all, a quick show of hands from the audience. How many of you think we will get a European deposit insurance scheme? Raise your hands. OK, we have, for anyone who is not able to see the audience, we have a very healthy, I'd say, 80%, although I'm not a math 
It's a good majority. The good majority of the room thinks they'll get it. I should also say, sorry, those of you who are online, there is um, an online forum where you can ask questions. I think someone was going to give me an iPad so I can see those questions. So yeah, I'll get them from the iPad. Anyone in the room, just if at any point you want to ask a question, just um, raise your hand and we'll get, we'll get a mic to you. Elke, your defence of the need for the third pillar. I think we need a third pillar if for the simple reason of the word that Andrea hates, that I hate, home host. Because so far, we have a system where you have a European supervision, you have a European resolution scheme, but when it comes to deposit insurance, you are back to nationalizing. I could actually make a very simple argument, and I sometimes believe economics count. We have in Europe now, or we are building up the single resolution fund, 1% of covered deposits. We are building up, or we have built up, the DGSs, 0.8% of, of deposits. Quite a healthy number, 1.8% in total. This is nicely comparing to the US. It's 2% of, of deposits in the US. But our system has one European pot and 21 plus national pots. So, and this is an argument where you could say it would be by far more efficient and it would also protect the member states far better if it were a European system. The European part is fully, uh, fully now mutualized, the rest is fragmented. This is one argument, and I would, uh, but I would also agree with uh, Sean. I think we had been, and I would have hoped for more progress, like always, but we have been fairly close to moving the first step into EDIS. It was just one step too much, though. That's why when we now work on, when you now work on CMDI, you will get back to the same topics on harmonizing as a pre-step for then hop hopefully mutualizing it. I'm optimist by nature, otherwise I would never have taken up this job. <laughs> so do you think we'll see a deposit insurance guarantee scheme or the um, EDIS within, the, within your term? Do you think we'll see agreement My on it? My term ends in less than six months. Yes. <laughs> by now, no. You won't see EDIS during these six months. I'm not even sure that will you will we see, see it during, it Andreas term? during <laughs> the term of my successor. <laughs> but we will see it at some point. During a European our lifetime of version of FDIC. Well, I hope to live long, so I hope to see it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elke. Peter, I'm going to bring you in here. How important is EDIS to your member banks? Um, we are so diverse as the European discussion is. We have members who are fully in favour of a fully-fledged system, and we uh, have members who are completely against it. And the discussions that we have here show that within Europe, there is not this bright consensus about this topic as here in the panel and on the, in the room here. The problem, um, from my point of view, is that ADIS started, had a very, very bad start. I will never forget the day when the five presidents paper came up. I read this passage and uh, you were asked. Did you write this passage? <laughs> I, I read this passage and I, I, want, <coughs> I, I wondered how something like this could happen. Because here was suddenly on the table a final solution presented as the only possible and acceptable. And being in politics for many years, as the five presidents too, I asked myself, do you really start a political discussion like this? I think what we can all agree on is that we have to have the highest trust of depositors that we can reach. Looking what is necessary for this, I just want you all to remember that the mentioned 0 0.8 for the DGS, 1.8 together with the BRRD, is less, much less, than the Commission in her first proposal for the DGS has proposed only for the DGS. Just to remember, 2.5, that was the starting point, when the Commission told us all to reach trust within our countries, in the population of Europe, at the markets, we need to have not less 
then 2.5, 0 0.8 we ended up, 0 0.5 in France because of a concentrated banking market. So, but we have more trust than before, even if it's uh, just one third, only for Edis. So what this showed is to us, often it's not about only pure figures and only about pure systems. It's only about do the people trust in something or not. And we all know that if it comes to the hardest, hardest case, no deposit guarantee system in this world will hold. Not the US system, not ours. But as long as people trust that everything is done, that they are in person protected, nothing happens, you get no bank runs, people keep calm. So we should, if we really want to bring a process forward that takes into account our all key interest to protect the deposit, the depositor best, is that we should go all back to zero and think what is necessary to gain trust. And what do we urgently have to avoid to lose trust in systems where we have a lot of trust? In our membership, we have members who um, think it is very important for many reasons, for the home host problematic, for the trust in their countries, that we come to a fully fledged systems. But we have also members who say, in my country, in IPS systems, for example, are more deposits than in the first 20 European states deposit accumulated. If you damage trust in our system, just a little bit like this, what do you win for the stability of the overall system? So both arguments have a legitimate backgrounds. These are both legitimate positions. If we want to go ahead in Europe, we should get out of this front lines where we are in now since years, because then we will never end up good. Okay. When I say we should restart last half of the sentence, I really mean we should go back to something that uh, the former Chancellor Bismarck uh, said in the 19th century already. He said, if you want to understand foreign policy, and it's exactly the same situation here, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the one who is standing in front of us and look at yourself and try to understand you, then you understand him and then you get together forward. I think acting like this okay. is the only possibility to get ahead. So there's lots there to pick up on and I can see Elka and Sean are nodding at various points that they want to come in on. First of all, I want to bring in you, Irena. Um, from your perspective, how difficult or how easy is it going to be, do you think, to get agreement on what EDIS will look like? Well, we, we, we've seen how it's not easy, you know, <laughs> definitely. So uh, I think we all wish to be here celebrating something and actually... Uh, Possibly not all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, but uh, I think most of the people that are, have been working in the European institutions trying to, you know, achieve this... the advancement of the banking union uh, are a little bit disappointed. I, I was disappointed when I, when I read the, the conclusion uh, of the Eurogroup, although I appreciated uh, the, the, the effort that Pascal Donohoe put into this, and I really appreciated the, the, what, what he did, but uh, I was, of course, disappointed by the, by the outcome, where basically they, uh, uh, they agreed that they disagree on, on this, and they only agree on the fact they will just kick the can along the road. Uh, the endless road of the <laughs> of the banking union. So um, I, I don't know. I've been wondering myself um, uh, how we could uh, change the framework and how we can achieve the result because most of the people still, uh, you know, uh, agree on the fact that we need to advance in the banking union. But apparently, there is something about the journey that we've designed, or maybe the way it's been framed or proposed, or the way we've negotiated. And and actually, if we look at it, the, it has been changing along the line. I mean, uh, uh, for example, uh, at the very beginning, we we always talk about the, the three pillars, but at the very beginning, there was supposed to be a fourth pillar of the banking union with the bank structural reform. That is an, another 
piece that uh, fell along the road during the last eight years. Uh, and that was supposed to be a reform of the banking system that aimed at, uh, you know, at the time there was the issue of the too big to fail, and this was seen as an important move to reduce the risk. Uh, and then this was uh, abandoned eventually. Of course, Parliament has its own responsibility in that. I, I, I was not uh, in the Parliament at the time, but I know that Parliament has a, a, a big responsibility on that. But uh, my, my colleagues who were there at the time, they told me they didn't uh, get any big signs of sorrow on the side of the Commission, which withdrew the proposal right after. I, I might be wrong, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to engage. Uh, so, uh, so we started to think in terms of, uh, you know, how can we uh, achieve the banking union and uh, still reducing the risk? We started to look at uh, NPLs, for example. So we had the action, the roadmap uh, uh, on the NPLs, uh, the... Um, uh, the calendar provisioning. We so we started to move a little bit the target, and then we started to discuss about the uh, the sovereign uh, risk. So we started to move a little bit the target, and then the funny thing is that what they, uh, you know, we also changed the the narrative at the beginning. For example, the banking union the possibility of having uh, really uh, cross-border uh, big groups and exchanges was the mean to break, for example, the uh, sovereign bank link, you know? Uh, that, and then it became the opposite. We, the sovereign became the mean through which achieving the banking union. So we completely changed the, the approach. Uh, and, and I think we have to think about that because uh, probably the way that we framed things that made the road narrower and more rigid rather than trying to uh, open up. So we started to eliminate instrument to change the narrative, to change the, the final objective with the means through which achieving the objective. So I think this also ended up narrowing down the room for maneuver and for negotiation. So maybe... Now it's time to restart and trying to reopen the, uh, the field and open up a little bit the possibilities and maybe be more creative about how we want to, uh, to set up the, 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 the roadmap to achieve what I think everybody agrees is uh, something that we badly need. So are you talking about a more, in terms of like the design of what EDIS might look like, a more... I'm like flexible approach to what it might look like, maybe a little bit different in different countries or... No, I'm, I'm thinking about the whole thing of, of banking union because I agree on the fact that uh, it's, it's not that easy to tackle these things separately and, uh, and, and trying to say, okay, first we do this and then we do that and then we can do... This stepwise approach, uh, it, it, it proved to be very, very difficult, especially when what was supposed to be the final outcome becomes a prerequisite step to get to the next step. So, uh, so we are mixing up a little bit objectives with instruments and, uh, and, and people may feel that, uh, you know, of course, as usually happens in negotiations, someone is more interested in step one, but not in step two and vice versa. Someone is not interested in step one, but is interested in step two, but it says, okay, who grants me that I, if I agree on the step one, then the step two will arrive. Because you know, you know what? Sometimes what happens is that uh, I make a sacrifice on what is my, you know, uh, ideas, and I agree on step one, thinking that uh, we will get to step two, and then step two never arrives. So I, I think that we need to be. Um, a little bit more holistic in the approach of the banking union and trying to find a way to keep things together and find a new way of negotiating. Uh, but I, I don't have the right answer. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, I, I, I would be in a different position maybe if I had all the answers to how to handle that. But, uh, but uh, uh, my, my sense is that uh, it's really trying to be a little bit more creative in how we approach it. So, Sean, from your perspective at this stage in the game, 10 years on, how easy is it to reimagine some parts of banking union in a more holistic way and to do what Irina is talking about? Quite, I mean, if, if I'm honest, because, I mean, I agree with Irina fully, but in a way, the process we've just come out of is exactly that process where we tried to identify all the remaining steps in the banking union, try to approach it in a holistic way, but it hasn't worked. That, that was the work plan, essentially, was to lay out all the various elements we wanted to put in place and then move 
in parallel. That hasn't really worked out. It was a heroic effort by the presence of the Eurogroup, but it simply wasn't possible to overcome the, the, the many obstacles. So I, I think, in fact, now where we step is, is we are going to make a step forward in one of those pillars, which is crisis management. But what we will discover is that everything in banking union is a bit connected to everything else. So when you make this step forward, you're going to find that, you know, elements are not there that you would like to have there. And I think EDIS is one of those elements we will find that would be very useful to have yeah. if you're trying to build a, a, a fully consistent crisis management framework. But I wanted to come back to some of the, uh, some of the comments on, on EDIS and the passages in the Five Presidents report, which I, I can't remember. It's 10 years ago. Maybe I did write them. Maybe I didn't. I can't remember. <laughs> but, you know, what we put on the table as a proposal in 2015 was, in fact, something which was all that came later. It was, in, it was a complete move from liquidity to full risk sharing. It was, however, a consistent step. You just went from A to Z. There were no breaks in the middle. What happened in the discussion, of course, that people said they quite liked the step from A to M, but didn't want to go any further, and others wanted to go a bit further. So that all became a, a, another discussion about liquidity versus risk sharing, etc. But the first proposal we put on the table was internally consistent and had all three moving from, as you remember, liquidity to co-insurance to ultimately uh, full risk sharing. Uh, so there's another effort which didn't work. But I think when we put it on the table, the idea was not to undermine confidence in the national deposit schemes. It was quite the contrary. It was to reinforce confidence in national deposit schemes. Because, I mean, I am one of those people who believes that if you have a single jurisdiction like Banking Union, then one of the characteristics of a single jurisdiction is single or uniform protection for depositors. So every depositor should feel as protected as every other depositor, irrespective of whether they're in one part of the union or another part of the union. And that's what EDIS was about. It was about levelling off and making sure that everybody ultimately has the same level of protection. I think the problem that arose was, of course, that there was a sense that the risks within the union were not randomly distributed, let's say, and that some parts of the system bore more risk of accessing EDIS than others. And there was a sense that some parts of the union would be subsidizing other parts of the union if they joined in a, in, in a kind of mutualized framework. So we had the risk reduction, risk sharing debate, i.e. we needed to reduce all the risks in those parts of the union where, which were perceived as being more riskier so that we could then share risks. That actually was delivered. I mean, the risks have been reduced. They were identified in two respects, bailinable liabilities available in banks and non-performing loans. And on both of these metrics, the risks have been pretty much removed. So that risk reduction, risk sharing story is, is over. I suppose that was why I suppose some of us were a bit optimistic about the EDIS discussion, because the risk reduction, the risk sharing debate had ended. But uh, it wasn't to be. I mean, there are still other issues around that. But as I said, I still believe that as we go forward and work on crisis management, this one step, we're going to find that issues in the other pillars will re-emerge. So EDIS will be missed from the framework. Home host issues will most likely re-emerge in this context as well. So we will, um, we, I, I, I was never fully convinced of the kind of holistic approach in the sense of moving together at the same pace on all elements. It's very difficult to do that kind of general equilibrium stuff. But I do believe that you, even when you move sequentially, you, you will reach points where you have to stop and let the other parts catch up. So um, I think, you know, what has come out of the Eurogroup is still a very good result. We will, crisis management is a very noble area to be working in, if I may be honest. <laughs> it's a very important area to work in. As we know well. As we know well. But we will, we will discover that other parts of banking union will be needed. Thank you. So I certainly do want to spend a fair chunk of this on crisis management, but we do have quite a few questions around EDIS. Um, Elka, one for you from the audience who says, is there not scope to use the billions and billions stored in the SRF to become part of the Europe-wide DGS? What do you do with the SRF as it sits idle waiting for a crisis? Well, I'm not sure whether I'm so unhappy that it sits idle waving for the moment because it means that we didn't have a crisis where we had to even chip in this. And like the commissioner said in the beginning, 
I think we've proven that we can resolve banks, but I'm not sure that our target should be, can we resolve five per year? It should always be the exception and not the rule to resolve banks. But and what pretty do you do clear. With the money? No, for the time being, it's very safely. Is it in German and I'm looking at our <laughs> vice chair who is responsible for managing the fund. Uh, it's not a pleasure to be an investor for very safe investments in this environment. We have made the point uh, currently or recently to say if you really want to take a first step into a liquidity facility, EDIS, which was the first step of EDIS, why not engage the fund in this? The fund could be the one to lend to this system. Well, then, if nothing is happening, the money might st still sit idle, but it then sits idle in a EDIS compartment and to make it as a first step in the system. I still think it's worth thinking. It would use would need a lot of legal changes, uh, probably. Because I just also wonder, I mean, could, could the fund be the one to help narrow the yields on certain European countries' government debt? I see that as a real challenge. And probably I could easily say this is not within the mandate of the SRF and this is not in the mandate of, our, uh, of the SRB and in the mandate of the fund. No. But I would still believe that moving from where we are with these scattered funds to moving to quality European FDIC model. And to be fair, we have moved a long way even five years ago, I would only have talked about the European FDIC if I were closer to the door than all the others, because I would have immediately been killed. Nowadays, I think half our constituency is probably saying, yes, this is where we want to end in some form or shape. For this, the money within the single resolution fund could be one of the yeah, starting points to get the EDIS comp get the DGS component to get an EDIS component working. It's a long way and let's not be naive. We are regulated by a law or a regulation, but we also have an intergovernmental agreement and the like. So to get all this up and running will need political will, will need more steps to take. But let me perhaps, even as I have the chance, build on what Sean said. I think this idea, and if I've, it was an incredible effort and huge uh, will put in by Pascal Donahoe to come up with all the bits and pieces will prove helpful because it shows that this all needs to be addressed and the communication didn't say it will never ever come. It just says we start with one step and the next to come. And I'm firmly believing this is the only way you go forward. Because if you say I need to address everything at the same time and a bit in tandem for me normally translates at the end in it will be difficult and it might take long. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to come. Um, one questioner has a more general point, which actually touched on something, Sean, we talked about earlier, which is. Europe seems to make the biggest progress during and right after crises. Will it need another crisis for EDIS to happen? Peter, I'll go to you first on that one because you caught my eye. <coughs> it's um, not something that is uh, specially, a uh, special rule for the financial sector. I think uh, Europe, if you look uh, in many political fields, often moved forward uh, when there is a crisis. But it would be a crying shame if it only can move uh, if there is a crisis. No, I think um, uh, especially in the times uh, where uh, th that are not so tough, uh, we should all try to our very best to understand each other because that is what it's all about in Europe, that one understands the others and its needs and its uh, his legitimate interests. And from this starting point, uh, trying to find solutions that are more pragmatical and less um, let's say ideological, as some of the positions had been here in the past represented from all sides. Um, I hope we move forward 
even if there is no further crisis in the next time. Sean, was it easier to get things done in the good old days after the crisis? Well, they weren't very good old days to start with. Um, I mean, I have to say it is true that we tend to make the bigger steps after crisis because, as the commissioner said, there is a sort of there's something that has to be done, and then we get round the table and do it. Personally, and I speak personally, I've never found it a very efficient way to make progress because you have to receive quite a bit of damage before you make progress. Far better to make the progress before so, you know. It's a little bit like closing the door after the horse has bolted. Huh? So, and the banking union is a good example. I mean, the, we want the banking union because we want to restore the level of banking integration we had before the crisis. So now we have the architecture we need. The architecture we could have done with, by the way, to manage the integrated banking system before the crisis. We might not have had the crisis, frankly, if we'd had the banking union architecture before the crisis. But then we had the crisis and then we get the architecture and now we have to sort of use that to restore the damage that has been done. So of course, from an institutional point of view, from a bureaucratic point of view, it's very good to say that we need a crisis and then we jump forward. But I think from an economist point of view, not the most efficient way mm. to make progress for on an institutional basis. And we should be able to, in periods of calm, work it out and, and, and move forward. Elka, do you think we, we need a good crisis to get this going? I would full-heartedly embark to Sean's argument. Of course, you fix your roof normally in good times, and when you see that we are in very uncertain, uncharted water for the moment, I would rather like to have the roof fully fixed than just having a bit of plastic on and hope it will be sufficient. But honestly, I, I'm not so pessimistic. We have now, or the Commission now, has to come up, and I know there's a lot of work already gone into this with this crisis management deposit insurance well, review. And don't forget, there's also the banking communication review, so the state aid framework. And this will get us fairly soon back to some of the more integral question on harmonize, on broadening the scope of banks that go into resolution. If you broaden the scope of banks going into resolution, then you need to know how you fund if need be. And there the paper of the council is very clear. It says it's MREL on the one hand, so banks own fund to be yeah. built up. And it is the industry funded tools. And for me, industry-funded tools first and foremost translates into DGSs. And this means you need to talk about exiting the banks. You need to harmonize the use of DGS, not just as a pay box, which might be not the most efficient way. So purchase and assumption transaction or sale of portfolios and banks. And for this, you need to harmonize the question on what could be the upper limit to use yeah. those funds. So there is a lot, a lot of steps which basically pave the way into EDIS. Okay. I know we've taken a lot of questions, yeah. well, a few questions from the virtual audience. Have we any questions from the actual audience on the deposit guarantee scheme? Because we are going to move on to crisis management soonish. So if you have a question now on the deposit guarantee scheme, this would be a good time. Okay, the actual audience is very shy, so I'll come back to you. We've got two more from the virtual audience, and while the actual audience try to gather some courage for the next time I ask you, um, from the virtual audience, are uninsured depositors of consumers, um, are uninsured dip, 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 dip depositors, i.e. consumers and SMEs, at risk with the current crisis management framework if they have deposited amounts at medium-sized banks? Elka, I guess. I know you we have talked an easier question. Bit uh, about no, I, I would say the simple answer is no. We have a deep, uh, deposit insurance system, and but the probably also honest answer is de covered depositors are always safe. If the DGS is not sufficient, the national budget is the one to back the DGS. There is a clear understanding of a number of, whether you talk about DG, uh, SMEs, whether you talk about non-covered depositors, that you need to protect them in the interest of financial stability. And now let's be realistic. In most cases, this should 
be possible? Will it be a walk in the park? No. Will it, in some cases, overstretch the capabilities of the, uh, of the DGS? Yes. I am more fearful that it might overstretch, in some cases, the belief of depositors in other banks that the member state will manage. And this is, I think, again, a plea for a more European system. Because we have seen it in, in the past. Well, if you see some trouble here, why should someone in another bank be so worried? Yes, but they are. Because yeah. they believe the system might not be capable. And I think there, a European system is always a better basis. Okay, thank you. Um, another one, Elke, which is probably going to be for you again, although Sean, you might want to chime in. Um, without an EGIS, is liability and control to li truly aligned within the banking union? Hmm? So without having a European deposit insurance scheme, is liability and control truly aligned within the banking union? I can think of a one word that answer. Goes but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. I mean, no, surely. <laughs> Not truly a lot. No, no, no. But I mean, does, is, it, uh, is it misaligned to the point where it's a fundamental sort of problem in the system? No. no. I mean, what we have done with banking union is we have, we have produced a framework in which we can make decisions collectively as a union. So Andrea makes collective decisions through the SSM for supervisor, single decisions. I don't even use collective, single decisions. And Elka will make single decisions for resolution. So these are the decisions that are taken. Now, what is often argued is, of course, that the implications of those decisions are sometimes left at national level. And there you can envisage some misalignment and incentives between decisions that are taken centrally and some of the costs that might be borne nationally. Those mis misalignments can be managed now, and they are managed now, but they would be, as I keep saying, it's not that banking union is not working. Banking union works. It would just work more efficiently and more effectively with the third pillar. So those collective decisions can be managed, and they are managed, but they could be managed more easily, more efficiently, if we had a third pillar. So this is the sort of my, my commissioner's line of yes. the glass being half full. It is more than half full. I think it is two thirds full. But, you know, we prefer to have it full. Full, full. Okay. Um, another question, actually, Sean, which is, well, it's, a, it's addressed to the commission, which I guess in this case is you. Um, in the case of Sparebank, this is an easy one, actually. Well, the first part is, in the case of Sparebank, did the Austrian DGS have to pay out for the German branches of Sparebank? Would the Austrian, if the Austrian DGS had been too small, would the, Ger or, sorry, would the Austrian DGS be too small, had the German, op have been too small, had the German operation been slightly larger, which is more probably an, an Elke question. Um, they are both for Elka, I, I think. Well, I think the answer is really <laughs> very gallant of you, Sean. <laughs> okay, I think the answer is se separation of responsibility. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. It's unfair. <laughs> uh, no, to be fair, uh, the system is pretty clear that the Austrian uh, spare bank, uh, or that Germany was a branch of Austrian spare bank, and therefore the Austrian. DGS was responsible for this and from what I understood was supported in administration by the German DGS to manage it. So the costs in this case are for the Austrian system but also to be fair from the in this case and the Austrian DGS has long been repaid so out of the proceeds. How, how the overall case of the uh, Austrian spare bank worked and if that was a good case of like resolution working well, do you think? I think it was a very peculiar case. For me, a very good case and a very standard case of the resolution framework was the far larger case, Banco Popular, which was a bank that failed, which was also a cross-border active bank because it had a Portuguese subsidiary and where the sale of business worked smoothly if you were today to look into uh, Spanish government bonds you would not be able to spot the time of the resolution of Banco Popular. It was basically neither to be spotted there nor perhaps with one exception in any of the banks bonds or bank equity. It was a very clear case. Spare Bank was a bit of peculiar case because clearly the basic idea in this case was that if Sparebank 
fails, it will be for the Austrian parent to basically bear the losses and to resolve. Now, you never plan for a bank that fails due to a lock, lack of trust coming from a war scenario and looming uh, sanctions. So what we basically were faced was with a liquidity crisis, a, a classic bank run, which made it impossible for the parent to support the subsidiaries any further, so that we ended in trying to take uh, the best decision you can take at this point. And I'm always saying the resolution plan was very helpful to have a starting point to know where you were. But then you needed to react to the crisis and you needed to find the best solution at this point in time and not to say I had another idea for a totally different situation. And were there, any, were there any learnings from that case that you'd like to incorporate into policy going forward or was it just so unusual that it never happened again anyway? So. No, I think the one learning of this or one simple fact is you do a resolution plan for a baseline scenario. You try to prepare, you try to understand the institution with your baseline resolution plan. And the most likely scenario we always take is large losses make the bank non-viable. We also think about liquidity runs, but I think everyone in the room would have said, if, if the team that's responsible for the bank comes up with a scenario and what in case of a war, you would have said, did you have a bad night? Uh, can we please stick to realistic scenarios and a plan? So the plan is a baseline, but the plan is not something that makes gives, gives you a straight jacket. So you always need to stay very agile to be able to address the problem you have at hand and not to say I have a solution for another problem. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, Peter, we've got a question for you from the audience and it's a question I think that you're going to like and be able to answer easily. To Peter, is the cost of regulation affecting the bottom line for banks? Is the cost of, is regulation, the cost of regulation affecting banks' profits? For sure, everything that costs uh, affects profits, but uh, it's always a question, what do I get for it? And when banks have to pay to funds to create a stability in a financial system, Looking at the overall picture, it helps also banks, for sure. The question is only how much. If Elke asks us for 55 uh, billion euros in her fund, um, uh, this is what is politically agreed. This is uh, something um, that makes sense. At the moment, it looks like at the end of the day, she will have 80 um, instead of 55, which is much more than the original political agreement. Then it starts uh, to getting worth discussing about it. Elke, have you gone after them for an extra 25 bi million, <laughs> billion and where's it going? No, no I've not gone for after 25 billion on top just for <laughs> the sake of the SRB. No, to be fair, and Peter knows it very well, the 55 were projection by very reputable people at the point in 2012-13 to say this might be about 1% of cover deposit mm -hmm. at the end of the period. They were always a bit, as a guidance, they were not a politically agreed, we stop at that number. The agreement then was 1% of cover deposit. And I've always said those that wrote the legislation gave our team a fairly interesting task. You have to build up in even steps to an unknown number. Most people that had basic math classes know that this is a bit an unsolvable equation. I think we've done very well in trying to adjust it stepwise. And with depositors increasing till now, now the situation might change in 2022, 20, we might be closer to 80 than to the originally estimated 55. All right, thank you very much. Um, Irene, I've got a question for you from the audience. A decade on and seven years into operations, the SRB only has one woman on its board. Will Parliament accept an all-male board when the current chair, being female, steps down? <laughs> I think that the Parliament has been always very vocal about it and the Commission knows it very well. And uh, I think it's a collective effort that we have to make. And the issue is not 
I mean, for how I see it, is not simply to have a woman at the top, which of course is always a good sign, a good signal to give, but the, the point is to have women involved in the process. Because the problem is that for many years, when we received, uh, uh, you know, the, the number of candidates for a top to be evaluated for a top position, there were no women included in the process. And so this is a battle that we as a parliament always fought and we've been fighting also in recent years. And I think that we've seen improvements. Also, if you see the um, appointments that uh, uh, have been made uh, in the past couple of years the, in various uh, European economic authorities and institutions, uh, ESMA, IOPA, uh, well, I think we achieved good uh, good results, but they, 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 we started with the process. Totally, and, and I totally appreciate that, that that this is a journey and you can only, you, you, and you can only ap appoint people from the available pool, but very directly, if we get to six months' time, Elka steps down, will the Parliament say that there must be at least one woman on the board or will you accept an all-male board? I think that we need to we need to receive a pool of names that are gender balanced, and then we will evaluate on the base of competence because so that's even what if we, we end do. Up with a board so of selection, men, that's okay. The selection is made on the base of competence, as always has been the case. And uh, I, as a woman, I would never desire a woman at the top because she's a woman. All the women we have appointed, they were appointed because of their competence, not because they were women. But we want to have the possibility of evaluate women in the process. And that's the demand that we ask the commission when, or the other institutions when they have to send their names. We want to be able to evaluate both men and women and see who's best suited for that post. That's where we are inflexible. I understand that, but there's also an optics element to it. I mean, having a board which is entirely male clearly isn't going to look good. And there's also the element of balance where people argue that if you have a mixed gender board, that's an advantage in itself. So Elke, if you were to hand over to an all male board, would that disappoint you? I think there are some questions to which I don't take a position. I would hope that we keep a balanced board and that we keep the most balanced board by talent and by capabilities. And I would be probably disappointed if it's than an all-male board, but let's also be fair, and this is more to everyone outside, if women are not applying for positions, it's difficult to have women. So I would strongly encourage everyone for positions, please apply, it's worth the effort. Okay, thank you. Um, Sean, a factual question for you, um, which is a bit close to home for us, I think. What happens if a DGS backed by, to a DGS backed by an EU state, if the EU state itself is on the brink of bankruptcy? Let's hope this doesn't happen. This would be a rather troubled situation. Um, I mean, I, I think if that's the situation, then the problem is much wider than the DGS, okay? <laughs> So we're into bailouts again. So we're into a much different scenario. But I mean, there is no expectation that we will be in that scenario. So let's be clear. Um, but uh, there were, of course, risks during the last crisis. This was one of the problems which was emerging. That when you're in a, in a state which is in itself, the state itself is on the verge of, um, of bankruptcy, of course, it cannot underwrite all the things it needs to underwrite. But you must remember, we are working in the whole crisis management field. We are working towards a situation where that won't arise, where the need for the state to step in behind the national DGS. And this is, I'll give you what I was going to say earlier. When you work on crisis management, if you want to be cons you know, faithful to the underlying principles of the BRD, which is that you preserve financial stability, but you protect taxpayers to the highest, you do not want to have a situation where if the national DGS gets, uh, exhausts its funds, that na the na national government must step in. And that's where we're going to find that having EDIS around would be very useful because EDIS could play that role of providing liquidity that the st state would normally provide. So therefore, having EDIS in the frame will allow us to you know, satisfy both principles, both kind of objectives of this BRD fully preserve financial stability, maximum protection for the taxpayer. So I'm going to turn now to the crisis management framework. I think we've got about half an hour left on the panel. Um, 
Beyond the Edith, which you talked a lot about, Elka, what are the other potential sticking points do you think around the crisis management framework or what needs to be ironed out? Well, I think the first point is clearly, and the commissioner mentioned it, and Andrea also, I think, mentioned it, that we have a, obviously an agreement that we need to ensure that a bank that's failing, a mid-sized bank, can exit the market. We are living in a market economy, so we're not living in a system where the failing ones get some safeguards around and then carry on. So the main part is to ensure that a failing bank can exit the market without causing financial stability concern. For this, you can broaden peer, you can use the resolution powers. And as I said, then you need to think about what are the financing mechanisms behind. The second part is clearly something we've seen, and I hope for some movement there. We are living in a world where insolvency systems are national. And I've made the joke, I thought the Austrians should be similar to the German one. I assure you, we speak the same language, but the systems are different. So we have 21 or even more systems. And I would see, hope that we see some narrowing down of unnecessary hurdles within the national systems there. I'm not expecting that we, that we harmonize insolvency systems at all. I'm expecting that we harmonize the most measuring parts in this area. We need to address once more also the topic of a single banking market, which means where are we on liquidity waivers? I'm looking at Andrea, I think he's not happy with where we are. And the like could also be a topic, not sure whether it really fits into this framework. And those already would be good steps forward. But let's also be realistic to your previous question. I think we should never forget how much better the system is already equipped. Risk reduction got a bit out of our view now. We have achieved quite a lot, have made the system by far more resilient. So we are talking now when we talk about the crisis readiness, about a backbone to the system, yeah. but not about something that has to jump into action tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you. So, Peter, I'd like to bring you in here as well. In terms of the crisis management framework, mm. what are the key sticking points for your mm. constituents? And I guess possibly there's different ones given that you span such a large range, but maybe give us two or three of them. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, uh, we would uh, like to see here an evolution and not a revolution. Um, uh, we hope that uh, Elke sentence, the resolution is um, for not for the many, it's for the few, not for the many, uh, is kept alive. Um, and uh, will also, in a modified framework, um, be the leading rule. And we would hope to see here more proportionality in all regulation that we have in. So this means uh, looking at the size, the complexity of business uh, models in all things, from the resolution planning, but this is something in general that we would ask for. If we could manage this, uh, then I think we meet better the needs of all the actors on the financial markets. Okay, thank you. Um, Irene, I'd like to bring you in as well. What do you think are the key, are, are going to be the key sticking points around the crisis mechanisms? Well, you, you mean in Parliament? The yes, Parliament debate? in Parliament, because yeah. We, 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 mm -hmm. I still can't you know, tell much about, uh, because we haven't opened the debate yet, so we have to still see <laughs> uh, the proposal. So, but of course, this is a topic that we have been discussing over time. So uh, the, the, what I can foresee as, a, as an issue, and one thing that I have to say, that, that, that is I want to, to make it clear. The fact that we have isolated crisis management and uh, living the edis, which is supposed to be the most controversial, doesn't mean it will be easier, honestly. I, I don't think, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, don't, I, oh, I am myself an optimistic person, but I need to be realistic as well. And uh, um, the crisis management uh, has its own challenges. And, uh, and one is what uh, uh, Jean just mentioned, uh, the fact that it's uh, closely linked, uh, for example, to edis as well. 
because then it, it would be difficult to, to have that kind of uh, uh, intervention without addressing the issue of the funding and without addressing the issue of a common safe net. And uh, so these, I think, it will be the biggest uh, issue and the biggest challenge that may, uh, you know, make it difficult to, 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 to get an agreement. Not to mention the risk, I, I hope I'm wrong, that we end up undoing some of the progresses we've made to the extent to which if we go back to a more renationalized uh, <laughs> way of addressing the crisis, we narrow the scope of, uh, of uh, the SRB. And for me, that would be something to avoid, but it's a, it's, it's a risk because if there is no, um, you know, Exactly. With no, it is no possibility of having a European safe net. That that's the risk that uh, when you are going to review the crisis manager, you end up re-nationalizing or re-pushing everything on the national DGSs. So I think this uh, this could be another issue. But uh, I mean, it's early. I don't want to be pes too pessimistic. We will put all the effort in trying to make it work. But it is indeed a, a challenge. So, so Sean, how optimistic are you? about crisis management getting through fine? Oh, I'm very optimistic. Um, I'm even more paid to be optimistic than other people. But no, I am very optimistic. I think, I mean, we're all experts around here, but this all boils down to pretty much what Elke said. You know, we want to have a framework that allows banks of all sizes and all business models to be managed in a crisis in a way that reconciles these two fundamental objectives of the BRD. You preserve financial stability and you protect the taxpayer. That can be done, but as we've seen in the cases so far, it, ha it has created a lot of stresses in the system. It, it doesn't need to be as stressful as it has been. Now, it's an old story. You know, we used to know how to handle banks that were too big to fail. Governments used to bail them out. And now we've moved to a system where you know, creditors bail in and governments no longer bail them out. So we know how to handle the big banks. And we know how to handle the very small banks. They go into judicial liquidation and they're taken out. The same old problem arises. What do you do with those banks in the middle? The ones that are too big to be managed through judicial legis legislation or judicial proceedings, but not big enough to fit into the framework yeah. as we have it now. So what we want to do is to extend that framework to capture those banks in a way that allows them to exit safely from the market, preserving stability and not costing the taxpayer. And that means we have to go back into the system and look at uh, certain changes we would have to make around the use of resolution. So that relates to mm -hmm. not just, we always speak about the public interest assessment, but also the early intervention part has to be discussed mm -hmm. as well because we have issues there. So I put those together. If we're going to extend resolution to these mid-sized banks, which may not have internal funding, may not have bail in funding available, we have to think about what external funding available so there, you know, we have national DGSs. Are they able, are they most efficiently able to intervene? In some cases, yes. In some cases, they're able to intervene in many ways. In other countries, they can only pay out. The question arises, is this the most efficient way to organize DGS? So you must look at how you organize your DGS to optimize your funding possibilities. And then to do that, you're going to have to look at how DGS is treated in the insolvency framework. So yeah, it's, 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 back it's to the insolvency. Which brings us back. So <coughs> as Irina said, mm. nothing easy there, but at least the issues are clear. We know what the issues are. They're fairly, they're technical issues at one level. They have a lot of politics stringing out of them as well, but the issues are clear. And when you think about the medium-sized banks, to what extent are those political issues complicated by the ownership of them in certain countries? No, I don't think... Um, no, I, that, that's that's really not the issue. The, the issue is really where you draw the line between the medium size and the small size. That's the that's the more important issue. Where they're located, I think, is less important. Or who owns them? Either. Or who owns if, them? If they're owned by the German council. What really is important is how how you draw that line and how you work out you know those banks. And that will be a, a decision ultimately for probably for Elka to do. We'll have to draw that line and say, well, this one I can take into resolution, and this one I will send to uh, national in but Elke will need to be will need to feel secure that when she sends it to the national level that the national level can handle it I think that's probably one of the topics we had to learn that we need to 
really have a clearer understanding of what the national DGSs then are capable and allowed to do, because otherwise you might end a bit in this situation, well, the national authority should take action and says atomistic liquidation will be a disaster. And at the same time, you don't have really an answer how to deal with a mid-sized bank. So I think there's a lot of work to just Good. clarify and then to build the necessary funds, be it in-house or be it as part of a framework to deal with what we, I think, all call under alternative measures. So if you talk about purchase and assumption, well, if the DGS then says, but then I'm off the hook because I'm only there for payout, it doesn't fly. Okay. We've got another audience question. Um, Sean, this one's going to go to you because it's going back into the crisis previous one. Um, speaking about crisis management, do you think precautionary recapitalization worked well in the last decade, especially under its temporary aspect? <laughs> uh, and maybe explain the temporary aspect for well, 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 the precautionary recapitalization is essentially a temporary um, okay. concept. It's given to you as a precaution and then it's supposed to be given back when the temporary disturbance has passed. Has it worked well? Um, but it has worked, that's for sure. I mean, we, we have used it and it did prevent problems. Um, Who did we use it for? We used it for Monte Pass. Okay. Uh, they haven't paid it back. I was going to say, are we calling that a success? But, you know, as I, as I always had this discussion with, with Elka, we never define what temporary is. So, I mean, temporary comes to, to an end when it's right to come to an end. But I, I think it's another area where I think if we get the crisis management framework right, we get the early intervention part right, we get all of the other parts right, precautionary recapitalization will itself also work better because it was one of the instruments we were having to use in these stressful situations where, as I said, the crisis framework wasn't optimized and it's still not optimized. But I think if we can get it into a better shape, all those things around precautionary recapitalization will become much easier to use and will be used, I think, for, let's say, more standard purposes. Elke, are you a fan of precautionary recaps? I would say uh, within this entire framework, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look into the crisis management framework. We also need to look into the banking communication, which is DGCOM's own rules around state aid to align them. Here we have still work to do and I would stay consistent to say and we need to have in aligned incentives. So far, neither the bail-in rules are the same nor do we have a fully aligned log logic there. So this needs to come. I would leave an instrument like precautionary recapitalization in but with a clear understanding what temporary means. Temporary is not eternal. But is it three years? Is it five so years? You, so you would effectively have a maximum yeah. cap on it. Yes. A cap. I, would, I would think we... I'm not even sure whether I would put a maximum cap on it in writing, but I would have a clear understanding what temporary means. It was designed like TARP yeah. for bank to restore <coughs> confidence, not to be used but to basically then thereafter we being withdrawn. And I think there is still room to go, but I agree also with Sean, uh, it has to be part of the overall framework. Okay. On to a more general topic, and this is going to come to all of you at some point. Um, quite a lot, we're talking here about the test of time, and it has been a decade, give or take, since Banking Union was first envisaged. A lot has changed in the world since then. So how do you think about whether banking union is fit for the financial landscape now? And like, are we arguably fighting the old war and actually we should be spending more time thinking about crypto or thinking about shadow banking rather than still dealing with this thing from 10 years ago? Sean, is there an opportunity cost in terms of how much time is needs on a banking union versus <laughs> the new finance out there? I don't think, I mean, I, I think today, you know, the Europe remains pretty heavily bank dependent, if I'm honest, um, despite my own best efforts to push the capital markets union and to push the digital agenda, I don't think they are necessary, necessarily um, going to make the banking union somehow irrelevant in, in the short term or even the medium term. So I think the agenda we set ourselves in 2014 
to, comp to, to, to not only have, you know, to, to have an architecture which will allow us to have a properly supervised, um, adequately managed in crisis banking sector and an integrated banking sector is the same today as it was 10 years ago. Yes, there are changes. Yes, there are things on the horizon. We have digital, we have crypto, we have other things. Actually, digital and crypto are a bit different things for banks, to be honest. They present different channel, uh, challenges. But I think this does not in any way reduce the, uh, the, sort of the, the, the validity of the banking union argument at all. But is there an argument for maybe updating it? Not particularly. In, I mean, not as we, as we have laid it out. I mean, you always have to be aware that the world is changing and we change bank regulation all the time. But the construction of banking union, the architecture we put in place and we want to put in place, I think remains valid today. Elka, do you think banking union is still fighting the right problems? I think banking union as a concept is spot on. I would not see this changing. Where you need to be mindful is that you keep an open eye where you might see you have always focused on this and this problem. Well, a problem might be a different one. So keep an open eye on what if a bank is failing due to something that 15 years ago you wouldn't have considered a problem, like a cyber risk attack. But the basic concept to have within a very integrated market one banking supervisor, one resolution authority and a safety net, which is the same for all of us, is there. What I find what I, where we need to make progress, but we haven't, miss, we haven't missed the boat, we have not, we are not fighting an old war, is that capital market union needs to come in place because still it's helping the banks also to have a strong European capital market. And, but no. I think overall, banking union is as relevant today as it was when we invented it. Peter, do you agree? It's as relevant today as it was when they invented it. Maybe you didn't think it was ever that relevant, but... <laughs> <laughs> How relevant it would have been to be already in place, we saw in the crisis, and it will rem remain relevant uh, for all times. The question is how much do we have to... Uh, work on it and uh, as I said before evolution not revolution so to make things better to sharpen things to create perhaps more predictability uh, or transparency in the one or the other thing these are uh, uh, the things we have to uh, to solve and uh, work on and I think it's not con not a contradiction to work on both uh, to deal on the one hand with all these questions coming up with uh, digital currencies uh, crypto all these things on the one hand and on the other hand and uh, not, uh, not to forget to adjust the regulation for the banking union always to the needs of the time. Because, Reina, when you think about the overall priorities in the political landscape, the next crisis, we talked earlier about how a crisis can really gather a lot of momentum and focus. The next crisis looks more likely to be in the digital slash crypto area than in the banking area. So is that going to mean that a lot of the focus like, gravitates towards Mika rather than really the kind of political support that, that they need for banking union? I think we need both. I mean, I, I don't think they are incompatible. We are working on both things. We are, uh, you know, now we are in the negotiations on, on Mika. Uh, Christine Lagarde came to us in, in, in our monetary dialogue the other day, and she was already talking about Mika too. I, I <laughs> because she said we need to do more. And Not a fan, Sean. <laughs> I'm just, you know, putting it to you on your table, uh, Sean. And, and uh, so so that's definitely a stream of work that we've taught it. Uh, you know, honestly, I, I think, of course, it's a big thing for us to be able to close uh, the Mika negotiations. Uh, you know, we, we have a trial next week and uh, hopefully. So but I think it's the beginning, of course. I don't think it will be ended there. You know, I, I think we will need to monitor this. Uh, so when the, everything that entails the cybersecurity, we, we, we did the DORA, the yeah. digital operational resilience. Uh, we have this uh, continuous uh, uh, you know, dialogue uh, with the ECB on the uh, 
digital euro. So, of course, this is something we have to monitor. We have to be ready, uh, you know. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can do without a strong and resilient and really truly European banking system. I don't think we are there yet. Uh, I don't think the two things are, you know, substitute one for the other. Uh, and so I, I really think that we need to... Uh, to push because having a strong and resilient banking system actually will help financial stability also in the face yeah. of emerging digital yes. risks. If we have that kind of banking system that is more resilient, more profitable, more integrated, and also capable of innovating, because let's face it, some of the innovation that is coming up, uh, like mushrooms, uh, unregulated, is also because the, the, the banking system failed the innovation challenge and uh, didn't see some opportunities that are others seen. So, so I, I think this it's our job to, to help the banking system to become more resilient, more profitable, more truly European. Thank you. So, Sean, there's certainly a feedback loop there in terms of what happens, say, in the digital landscape and the banking landscape and the financial stability world. Do you see any potential for the crypto crisis to get so big that it actually triggers a crisis in the banks that would then give you the capital to kind of get banking union moving faster if it becomes a financial stability issue for no. banks? I hope not. Um, I don't think so. I mean... Because there is, you know, there are some linkages there. That no, there are, are linkages. I think we, we may have been, in a sense, lucky that this correction, and, and we're not sure it's yet, it's a correction now, it happens now, because we have be, begun to become a little bit more concerned about crypto and that space in, in two dimensions. One, it has been getting bigger, of course, and, and growing quite rapidly. Not yet at a sort of systemic level on its own, but still growing quite rapidly. The second area we worry about is, of course, in interconnections between this new part of the financial system and what we call the traditional part of the financial system and the banks. Not so much so far. Um, so I think if people are hoping for a crisis coming that route to build a banking union, uh, I hoping, don't I want it and I don't think it's a risk <laughs> in, in, at the moment. Uh, but I think, again, not, not a good idea to start looking around for useful risks to build a banking union. No. Fair enough. Um, Irena, we've got another question for you from the audience, um, the digital audience. Um, the questioner says, the Eurogroup didn't agree on a work plan to complete banking union. Should the European Parliament now take up the mantle and attempt to agree a work plan? I mean, we can try, but unless there is an agreement at the level of the... Uh, of the member states, uh, you know, we, we do have, we still have the, the EDIS proposal in the drawer, you know, it, it, it's there. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe we can try to resume it. And uh, I have tried to talk to the uh, rapporteurs from time to time and see, but uh, if we don't see the political will you yeah. know, to really push it. I, I think the parliament alone, uh, it's, we are co-legislators. There is this co that, uh, <laughs> at the beginning that, uh, but, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe you're right. Maybe we should uh, try to, to, to try to, to push and force a little bit more and see if it works. But uh, we have tried on many other accounts and, uh, and then ended up, you know, stranded on the beach, <laughs> you know, but, uh, We'll see. We'll see. Um, Sean, for you, I hadn't thought of this, but um, in order to complete banking union, do we need to prevent member states from being shareholders of banks like it happens in Portugal, France, Belgium, Germany or Italy? No. no. Does anyone want to ban state ownership of banks for banking union to go ahead? I don't see it really as, as really a relevant issue, frankly. Um, OK, that's a quick answer for that one. Well, I think we have two or three more. The digital audience is very active. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. I have tried many times. After this one question, we'll come to the physical audience where we have got hands. Thank you. Um, this is for, I think, either Elka or Sean, probably. What, would, what could be the destiny of a bank failing, its, failing from a precautionary recapitalization is... P-O-N-V, a new restructuring plan, a liquidation? Well, I think the legal framework there is pretty easy. 
if the bank fails its commitment within a precautionary capitalization, this would turn it from a commission point of view into illicit, uh, illicit uh, state aid. And this, in turn, makes the bank failing or likely to fail. Now, this is the legal yeah. text, so I think there's nothing to add. Okay. Unless Sean has a different oh, interpretation. No. I'm just also conscious of yeah. people's coffee break. Um, we will take the, the questions from the audience in the room with questions. I did see a hand there from the lady at the front. If you could please, if you'd like to identify yourself and your question, that would be great. Hi. Uh, is, can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah, it seems great. Hi, uh, Catherine Carlson. I cover financial services for MLEX. Uh, my question is for Mr. Berrigan. Commissioner McGuinness in her speech earlier was talking about the upcoming legislative proposals on crisis management. I'm wondering if you can shed any light on what we might be able to expect from these. Well, I think I, I've probably covered a lot of the ground that, that they will cover. Um, as I said, I, I think what we want to try to do is to solve this problem we've had and we thought we might have solved with this framework, that is how to handle those mid-sized banks that do not fit well with the resolution framework, but are also difficult to manage at national level using simple judicial proceedings. So we will have to, and I think if you read the Eurogroup statement, you'll see there are four or five areas where they suggest we should work. Um, we agree that we should work in those areas. That's probably not a big surprise since we're sitting around the table of the Eurogroup. So we will work in the area of extending resolution. We will work in the area of funding. We will work in the area of organization of DGS and, and lease cost tests and where DGSs fit into the, the insolvency proceedings. But as I, Irena rightly pointed out, these are um, technical on one level, but they have political implications as well so this will be a, this will be a, an, an interesting discussion thank you and we have another question from the audience uh, the lady back here i think wanted to ask one hey it's um jody i'm part of the capital solutions group at natwest markets um uh, elka i think you mentioned before that there's one first step um to mutualizing which is harmonizing what are your views on the possible implementation of full depositor preference across Europe, so like we have in Italy and, and Portugal and Greece, and do you see that happening anytime soon? I'm not sure that I got the question fully here, it might be my ears. Yeah. Uh, depositor preference, I think, is a topic which is part of what will be within your proposal, because if you talk about funding, well, then you talk about a DGS to be part of the funding. Now, you need to have some, I would call it even a cap, called least cost test. And if you look into historic experience in depositor systems being exposed, then it was mostly a pre-funding of covered depositors because out of the proceeds, in the end, the DGS was repaid from the proceeds of an insolvency. So in a nutshell, in a world of where you forget about interest, the least cost is zero. This is not very helpful if you want to fund something. And, and maybe just a very quick follow-up question. In um, a Europe where full depositor preference were to exist, would you see um, minimum emerald subordination requirements being reduced potentially? Uh, the very simple answer is that the fabulous 8% to, ex uh, to, uh, to access the fund are part of an intergovernmental agreement. So this needs all member states to agree to something else. So not for us. I would say in my words always, all banks need to have a sound layer of capital slash MRO. And then you might talk about different solutions. I'm not a firm believer that I say I need to be very firm on the big boys. I have an insolvency for the very small. And the ones in between need to have somehow a free lunch. So they also need MRO. They also need to be resolvable in my words. But let's wait for the proposal. But clearly with the old 
with the current super priority of DGSs, you will not get much funding contribution from a DGS. So you need to think about what is the right point. I would say depositor preference is a good starting point. Okay, thank you. But that's my personal view. I hope that has answered the question. Unfortunately, we are just a bit out of time and I'm conscious of people's need for caffeine and also of everyone telling me to wrap up. So um, thank you so much to my panel. You've been excellent. That was a very fast um, hour and 15 minutes. Um, So thank you so much for everyone. Thanks very much to our virtual audience who was great with all of your questions and to those of you in in the room as well. Thank you.